Okay, let's do some more curves here. Um, I sent you guys an email about the reviews that for the next test. It's already up. Let's continue curve sketching. We are going to jump to example 11F. The first non trivial graph. Try e, try e on your own. Um, it's a very instructive example. It's kind of the example that you'd expect. Um, that's going to kind of show you why you can't really rely on the first order to figure out a concavity, which is what Nikolai was suggested. I understand why he suggested it. Um, yeah, it's like it's you kind of think because something goes like this and goes like this, how do you expect it to shape? Hmm? Yeah, you're thinking it shapes like this. Hmm. Which is not always true, right? You could be like this. You could be like this. You could be like this, yes. right? There's no way to predict that you will always be concave up the whole time. But here's the thing: didn't you say that the derivative of some of a function at a point where it's like sharp could literally be like that, 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 that? that. Like, there's no one true derivative. Yeah. Like in the in the graph of y equals like the the absolute value of x at zero, it's like there's no clear concise derivative. So that is the only one that has an actual concise derivative of zero uh, at a certain point when. Well, you didn't have to do this sharply. Then you're doing it in a curve, in which case, like. Yeah, it's not it's not what you think. Is what I'm saying. Okay. If you do the example in, in part E, you'll see. The concavity is kind of, it's not predictable in that sense. Um, but um, we want to jump to F because I really want to give you guys something that has like some asymptotes in it. Because it will make things a lot fun. A lot more fun. Um, so let's actually just jump into this. So our first step was to do what? Domain. Figure out what our domain looks like. So, what is it? This is a square. It's x squared. So that means it's a. Right, so this is just the top you can't really factor over the real numbers, but the bottom is really this. So x equals plus minus 2. Right, so it cannot be minus 2. It cannot be plus positive 2. That's our domain. The next thing was to do what? Find the intercepts. Yeah. What about x intercepts? What do those look like? When y equals zero, for y to equal zero, what we need? Mm. What do we need for a fraction to be zero? Mm. Uh, fraction to be zero, we, uh, specifically zero, we need the numerator. The numerator is zero. So that's the guy we want to solve. It has no solution. No real solution anyway, so we can't graph it anyway. Oh. So no x intercepts. That's probably what about the y intercept? Um, just plug in x equals zero, right? So you get y equals one over minus four. So y equals minus a quarter is your y intercept. Third step, this is the step that we skipped on all the other ones because they were, we were just graphing polynomials, but these are asymptotes. Wait, why, why would we leave um, x with no solution? Couldn't we just leave it as? It doesn't touch zero. Yeah, x squared plus one is never zero. Right, not in real numbers, right? I mean, technically the solution is plus or minus i, but you can't plot that on a graph. So, um, we just consider it no, no solution. Asymptotes were the next one, which we never had those before because we were grabbing polynomials. So now we're, in this case, this is not a polynomial, we have to consider asymptotes. So let's start with the horizontal asymptote. How do we find that? Right, you find the limits to, to at infinity. So you're going to say limit as x approaches infinity of x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. 
and you want to find the limit as x goes to minus infinity of x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. What's the answer in this one? 1. 1. Same. Same. This means that y equals 1 is a horizontal asymptote. How did we find the vertical asymptotes? You said the denominator is 0. Right. It's a rational function. It happens where the denominator is 0. It's exactly these guys that were not in my domain. So I'm going to set x squared minus 4 equals 0. So I'm going to get x equals 2 or x equals minus 2. Those guys are my vertical asymptotes. Oh, easy. That's easy yeah. enough. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, and especially if you remember the rules here, remember when you're going to infinity, all you do, you care about the biggest guys, right? The powers were the same on the top and bottom, so we just went to the ratio of the coefficients. That's how we told you the answer so quickly. Um, so remember, the power is larger on the bottom, it goes to zero. The power is larger on the top, it will go to either plus or minus infinity. In either case, in, in that case, you will not have a horizontal asymptote. You only get this guy if you have a constant number here. And so as long as the numerator is the same or smaller than the denominator, you will have a horizontal asymptote. So now that was the asymptote step. That was basically it. So for horizontal asymptotes, you take the limits at infinity of your function. And for the vertical asymptotes, if you have a rational function, which you won't get anything more complicated than that, you set the denominator equal to zero. And these are the x values that you have to avoid. So they become asymptotes. Um, what was the next one? Increasing, decreasing, right. maximum. Increasing, decreasing, maximums, minimums. And what do we need here? You need to find the derivative of the original function. How do I find that? Quotient. Quotient. Right, so we take the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the bottom squared. Here. Well, 2x is a common term. I can factor that out. I can left with x as it is. So I'd be left with x squared minus 4 minus x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 4. X squared. Right? So now these x's die, and I just have um, minus 10x over x squared minus. So now what we need to do is we need to find critical points. Now remember, critical points occurs where f prime is 0 or undefined. Before, we could ignore the undefined thing, but now it's a rational function. We have points where this is undefined. So f prime is 0 means that your x is 0, because it's a fraction. You're only 0 if the top is 0. And undefined happens when x is plus or minus 2. Same guys here. So. Here we are testing in f prime, we're testing 0, minus 2, and 2. And we're going to plug in numbers in between each of these intervals. And we're going to plug it into the derivative. So let's say a minus 3. And remember now, this problem is long enough, so we're going to try to be smart about this and be short on time. Notice that your denominator is a square, which means it will always contribute a positive number. So I, you can literally ignore the denominator and only care what, about what the numerator says. If I plug in a minus 3 here, I have a negative times a negative. That gives me a positive. So that means increasing. Plug in a minus 1 here, looking only at the numerator, because the denominator is always going to give also me a positive. Also increasing. So it's going to give me a positive. So it's still increasing. Plug in a 1. The numerator is going to give me a negative. So that's decreasing. Plug in a 3. The numerator is going to give me a negative. So that's still decreasing. And... What do we have here? What can I say about this guy? Nothing. You're increasing on both sides. Same thing with 2. What about 0? I guess that's a maximum. It is a maximum, right? Because we are already defined at 0. 0 is in our domain, so our function exists there. And we're increasing on the left, decreasing on the right. That makes 0 a maximum. In other words, 
we're increasing on these intervals, minus infinity to minus 2, union minus 2 to 0. We're decreasing on 0 to 2, union 2 to infinity. And we have a maximum at 0, comma. How do I find the y coordinate of this maximum? Plug, plug, it plug, it in. plug into the original equation. If I'm looking for a y, I plug into the original equation. But plugging in x equals 0 is pretty much the y-intercept. So that's just minus a quarter. That. So again, <coughs> quotient rule, so it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is going to be 2 times x squared minus 4 times 2x over the bottom squared. Figure out where this guy is zero, so we're going to want to simplify. And how do we simplify? Mm. Common terms. X squared minus four is a common term. Let's factor that out. What power do I factor out? I have here to the squared. This power is to the one. You always factor out the lowest power, so I'm factoring out to the one. Um, minus ten also seems to be a common term. So I factor out of minus ten. Put it in front. And that's pretty much it. So now what do I have left over? In this case, I just have an x squared minus 4. Minus, I took out the negative 10. So that x is left. That 2 is left. I took this out, and then there's another 2x left here. Okay. This, simplify that one to the third power. So I have minus 10 inside these brackets, what do I have? This guy here is just 4x squared, right? Mm -hmm. So now I have x squared minus 4x squared. So that's minus 3x squared minus this 4. And that's my second derivative. So now I want to find critical points. That means the second derivative is going to be 0 or undefined. Undefined is that plus or minus 2, it's 0. Where is it going to be 0? Well, technically here, I can factor, I can factor out a negative sign here. Right? So this will become plus, plus, plus. So now I have 3x squared plus 4, never 0. Right? So this case does not happen. Because right? I have a square plus something. It's never going to be 0. So I only care about where it's undefined. So I'm just going to test minus 2 and 2. So in the second derivative, I'm going to test minus 2 and test 2. Plug in a random number over here, like a minus 3. Now again, we're going to play this wisely. I have, this top here is always going to be a positive number. right? This is a cube, so that's not always going to be positive. So right now I'm focusing on the denominator. So I'm going to plug in minus 3 here. What's going to happen? I'm going to get 9 minus 4, which is positive. So that means concave up like a couple. Um, plug in a number here like 0. This would be negative 4 cubed, still negative. Concave down. Like a frown. frown. Like a frown. Plug in 3. I will get 9 minus 4, positive again. Like a couple. So that means this is an inflection, right? Mm -hmm. What makes an inflection? Can I get any changes? And 
it's a portrait of the And you're doing to perfection. No, they're not. Why not? Because they don't exist anymore. They don't exist. They're not in the domain, right? There's uh, a vertical asymptote here. If your function exists there, they would be. But you have to remember, they're not in your domain. That's why step one was important for you to realize here. Yeah, minus two is actually not a point on the graph, right? So this is it's nothing, right? So we just have concavity here. We don't really have any reflection. Um, so, but I do have a concavity. So I know concave up minus infinity to minus two and two to infinity. I have concave down on minus two to two. And inflections, I have none. And with that, we can draw the picture. Okay, let's start putting in our, our important points. What were our x-intercepts? Did we have any? Mm. I don't think so, right? No, we didn't have um, any. We did have a y-intercept. Negative 1 fourth. Which was here, let's put that at minus 1 fourth. We also knew that it was a maximum, I, I, I recall. So here, that's a maximum. Um, in the next steps, we had asymptotes. How's the negative yeah. above the coverage? Oh, yeah, I think I want to. I was like, one fourth. You know, see if you're paying attention. Uh, that's a maximum. Um, our asymptotes were where? Uh, Minus two and two, right? No, our horizontal asymptote was one, and our vertical was uh, plus, uh, plus minus two. Right, so asymptotes, you draw broken lines, and our vertical was minus two. So minus two was a vertical asymptote. Maximum. And what else do we know now? About increasing, decreasing concavity. Where are we increasing? Uh, where are we increasing? Negative two. It was increasing, increasing, and then decreasing, decreasing, right? Mm -hmm. So I know here I'm increasing, here still increasing, here decreasing, here still decreasing. Right? That was it. Uh, concavity. Over here, oh, I, this is still here. So this is concave up, all the way in between, we're concave down, and then we're concave up to the rest of the graph. Okay, so now we can start to plot. The middle is kind of easy. I know I'm concave down like a frown the whole time. I'm increasing and decreasing. So this must look like that. I can't touch these asymptotes. I'm always approaching these lines, but I'll never touch them. And I'll keep increasing here, keep decreasing there. Um, what about over here? I know I should be increasing. Okay, so where am I going to start? From here, increase? Yeah. Why do I have to be above? Because you can't cross X. And right. Remember, there are no X intercepts, so I can't start from down here. I have to be above the horizontal. Because if I was continuing to increase, I would cross this line. Mm -hmm. I know I don't cross that line. Um, but how do I know if I want to stay below here or above here? Because you want to. Oh, you start above, and then you literally just concave up or past it. You start here. Yeah. 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 Um, what was another option? Like, could I have been here? No. No. What would be wrong if I did that? Cross, cross, cross the one asymptote. So what? Can't. You can't. You just said you, you, you found you can't cross the horizontal asymptote. Nope. Never said that. What? Because you can only do that when it doesn't exist, but like an asymptote is possible. Read the thing here. 
It's possible for F to cross the horizontal asymptotes, but cannot cross vertical ones. Vertical asymptotes are what we can't touch. We can touch horizontal asymptotes in general. But why would that still be wrong? Well, my horizontal asymptote says my graph, as I'm going to negative infinity, should be getting closer to this line. So this would be wrong. Yeah. Right? Because that's not getting close to this line. If I start from above here, I'd have to be close to this line. So I would look like what? Down. But I have to be concave up. I know I have to be increasing like a smiley face. There's no way I can do that from below this line, right? At some point, you'd have to go back to concave down. Um, if you started below your asymptote. Yeah, because to, to, to like if I'm below, to settle at that line, I'd have to look like this, right? Mm -hmm. Which is concave down, right? To be above and settle at that line, I'm concave up. It could happen really far. Right. On the graph, but it'll have to Something like that would happen if way out here you were like that, and then you can come back. Mm -hmm. But why would that be a problem? Just because. Because you would have had an inflection. Because right? this would have given an inflection and the minimum, which I know don't exist. Right? None of those options are plausible. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you could get specific and start plugging in numbers to see exactly where you are. But to me, if you get used to how the graph would have to behave, you really understand what concavity means, what increasing means, all that stuff. You, can, you don't have to plug in numbers anymore. Um, and similarly over here, you would kind of have to look like that, right? And I know that without plugging in numbers for the same reasons, kind of going to be symmetric. The same argument that worked over there or worked over there. I can't start from below because that will mess up my horizontal asymptote. I couldn't have this and start from below because I would have to be concave down to make that work. I'd be decreasing, hit an inflection, hit a, hit a minimum, none of which I know exists. It has to be this curve. This is the only one that will be decreasing and concave up. And that's our graph. Um, in general, it is possible to cross a horizontal asymptote. If you ever want to check, you could do an extra check. Um, to make sure, if you're not sure, you can check if we cross the HA. How would you check that? Um, well, the horizontal asymptote is y equals 1. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is y ever equal to 1? Right? But what is y? Y was the original function, which was x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Set that equal to 1. Does that equation actually have a solution? Well, that would mean that x squared plus 1 is equal to x squared minus 4, which would mean that 1 is equal to minus 4, which is absurd. Right? So my graph never actually touches 1, which is another reason why I couldn't start from below and increase. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait. So if you set that equal to 1, that would imply that you're then you set the numerator and denominator equal to each other. Yeah. Oh, and then you're implying that. And one then I side. subtract x squared from both sides. Mm -hmm. I get plus one equals to minus four, which is crazy. So this has no solution, right? So in this case, I know I do not cross the horizontal asymptote, right? And so all the more reason that I couldn't start from below because to increase I'd have to cross it, but crossing it is impossible. So should we always check to see if we cross the horizontal asymptote? Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> and that's the way to check it, numerator. Yeah, you just set it equal to the number that you want to see if it, if, it, if it goes to it, right? And of course, it's not always going to be 1. The horizontal has to go to be 2 or 3 or 7. You just put that number here and see, does this actually have a solution? And you'll know that you cross the line at that point. It will take some of the guesswork out of things. Um, yeah. Um, so the so you could do a lot of things of what I did numerically, right? Just plug in a bunch of points. But the thing is, it takes time to do that, right? So you really want to get a feel for it, um, because like I said, this is going to be one question. You're going to have like eight others to worry about. You really don't want to spend more time here than than, than you have to. Right? Because curve sketching, as you can see, it's a long process to begin with. You really want to tighten up wherever you can.
Okay. Let's go to, going to do A and B from the examples below. These were from past finals. So, yeah. Like, is there a point where like eyes are like more practical? For what becomes practical? Like the, the, the eye? eye? Like, 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 um, of a negative number. Yes, that is practical. But at this college, we do that in a course called complex analysis. There's a specific class that deals with all of that. Like, you won't see it in calculus here. Like, calc one, two, three, you never deal with I at this college. Should we? No, no, no fine. It's probably not necessary for you to know it. Yeah, it's really like engineers, math majors, and physicists who really need to know about that sort of stuff. Right? Because they're imaginary, like in the in those people right there. Yeah. Um, usually any real world situation that you need that for, the math people will figure it out and just give you the form and give you the form. Um, so let's go to the second set of examples. Now this is kind of what you should expect a problem on your test to be. So here I'll give you the function and I'll actually give you the derivatives. Awesome. Right? So you won't have to actually find them. So, and it's going to be phrased pretty much like this. I'm not going to change the wording either really. I'm just, so I'm going to say, consider this function. The forms for this are given. They need not be verified. So don't go and find the derivatives to check if I gave the right derivative. <laughs> Just assume they're right. If they're wrong, it's my fault. I'm not going to downgrade you for it, right? So I'm going to give you the function, give you the derivatives, just assume they're the correct derivative, and run with it, right? And so that's going to help you save some time on the increase on the last two steps, right? And so what's important is you need to make sure that you give me all the things I asked for. So here I said, find all intercepts, asymptotes, extrema, intervals of this, intervals of that. You need to make sure that you give them, right? If I don't ask for it, then I don't even have to calculate it, right? But just make sure in the sentence, whatever is asked for, you make sure you do it and you box it, right? So here, I, I pretty much ask for everything here. So we're gonna find everything, right, from all these six steps, right? Um, but yeah. <coughs> Let's jump into it. So here, this function here is x squared over x squared minus 4, and you are given that f prime is equal to minus 8x over x squared minus 4 squared at double prime. All right, so that's all given, right? And I ask you to find all this information, sketch the graph. Um, Notice that in this problem, I didn't ask you for the domain, so let's skip it. Move on to step two. I asked you for intercepts. So we're going to have a little section called intercepts, and we're going to find both intercepts. What about my x-intercept? Right, so the numerator equals zero, right? So which means x equals zero is the x-intercept. Y-intercept. Well, of course, if x equals 0, you're going to get y equals 0. You're going to get y is equal to 0 squared over 0 squared minus 4, which is 0. So y equals 0 is the y-intercept. Okay, we are done with intercepts. What is the next thing we're going to need? Asymptotes. Let's look for the horizontal asymptotes first. All right? So here I'm going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over x squared minus 4, and the limit is x goes to minus infinity of x squared over x squared minus 4. What's this one? 1. And that's going to be the same thing. So you get y equals 1 is the horizontal asymptote. Could you ever get one that they're like not equal? Yep. Um, example B is a different case. Um, so, vertical asymptotes, set the denominator equal to zero, so we get x equals two, x equals minus two, these are both vertical asymptotes, right? It also obviously means they're not in your domain, right? So, 
I didn't specify the domain, so you skip that step. Because mm -hmm. vertical asymptotes are never in the domain. Those are the guys that you cannot touch because you divide by zero there. Okay. So far, so good. Next thing is increasing, decreasing, maximums, minimums. Right? So this definitely acts for all of these. Acts for intervals of increase, decreasing, and extrema, which is just another word for maximums and minimums. And what do we need here? The first derivative. But I actually gave you the first derivative. So we're going to use that function. Yeah. Critical points. It's whatever the derivative equals zero. zero or undefined. Yeah. Right? So it's equal to zero when x equals zero, right? Because the top is zero when x is zero. And it's undefined where x is plus or minus two. Plug in numbers like a minus three, a minus one. The numbers that you pick here are random, but pick nice ones as small as possible. Right? So I'm not going to plug in minus 17, like minus three. Right? Um, so kind of random, but just make them smart numbers that it's, they're easy to work with. And I'm going to be plugging in the derivative. Again, I'm going to notice the denominator is a square. So it's always going to be a positive number once I'm not at two or minus two. So I'm going to ignore that and just look at the numerator. Uh, if I plug in minus 3 here, negative times negative is positive, increase it. Negative times negative is positive, also increase it. That would be negative, negative, and this is negative. Right, so very similar to the last one, sort of. Professor? Uh, yes? Can you um, go over that little graph one more time? This one here? Yeah. Right, so I found the critical points. Do you understand how I got those? Yeah, you took a derivative. So I set this equal to 0. Uh -huh which means the numerator is zero. Mm -hmm. So that gives me x equals zero. Mm -hmm. um, for undefined, I set the denominator zero, because it's just plus or minus two. Mm -hmm. Draw those on a number line, zero, minus two, plus two. Okay. Now I'm gonna test numbers in between them. Right? Mm -hmm. Any random numbers, just make them nice. Right? I'm gonna take that number and I'm going to plug it into the first derivative, which is this function. Okay. And I only care about the sign. I don't care about if it gives me a positive number or a negative number. Right? So the bottom is a square, so I know it's always going to be giving me positive once it's non zero. So I'm only looking at the top. Okay. So then I'm plugging minus 3 for x. I get minus 8 times minus 3, that's going to give me a positive number. Similarly, minus 1 times minus 8 gives me a positive number. 1 times minus 8 is a negative number. 3 times minus 8 is a negative number. Okay. Right? So I only care about these signs. Now, in the first third, if the interpretation of a positive sign is increasing. So I know my graph should be going up. Negative signs is decreasing, so I know my graph should be going down. And so at this point, I can tell you about the intervals of increasing, which is uh, negative infinity to negative 2, union negative 2 to 0. Okay, about intervals of decreasing. Uh, 0 to 2, zero to two union to infinity. Do we have any maximums or minimums? Yeah, 0. Right, negative two and two are not in our graph, right? They are actually asymptotes, which I found from here. So zero is the only point that it is on our graph, and I'm increasing on the left, decreasing on the right. That makes that a maximum. So here I know I have a max at zero comma zero. So when you find the one value, you just plug in what we Plug found. into the original problem. Right? Okay. So whatever that x value is, you're gonna plug it into the original and then that's the corresponding y value. This was specifically asked for, so this is a part of your answer, box it. So that, that sentence where it says, find the intervals of increasing and decreasing and relative extrema, this, these are them. Okay. Now we're gonna do concavity and inflections, if there are any. For this we use the second derivative, which was given. points, double prime equals zero, or undefined. For a fraction to be zero, the numerator has to be zero. The numerator is 3x squared plus 4. That's never zero, right? Because if I try to set that equal zero, I'd have to take the square root of a negative. So this doesn't apply. 
but we are undefined at the same points where the denominator is zero. That was a cube. So x equals plus or minus two. So I'm going to test those guys. And again, plug in numbers in between them. And I'm going to plug the numbers into the second derivative. Wait, why did you plus out at the bottom zero? Because it's never zero. If I said this equals zero, there's no solution. Oh, yeah. So if you have a square and you add something to it, it's always going to be positive. Um, yeah, so I'm going to plug in minus 3 into this. Notice that the numerator is always positive, so I'm going to ignore it. Look at the denominator, because I only care about the signs. So plug in a minus 3 here. That's 9 minus 4. That is positive. Plug in a 0. That's minus 4 cubed. That's negative. Plug in a 3. That's 9 minus 4. That's positive. So here, positive, can't give up like a cup, can't give down like a frown, can't give up like a cup. And to conclude, we know we're can't give up on minus infinity to minus 2, union 2 to infinity. We are can't give down between minus 2 and 2. And no inflections. So for that series of questions, that's the answer. Why is there a union between the, the concave ops? Because there are two separate sets. I can be concave up here or here. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm writing down all the places where I can be positive. Okay. There are two separate regions. You draw them with a union. It means or. I'm positive that I'm over here or I'm over here. Okay. So, um, okay, so the graphs always confuse me. So for the second derivative, you, uh, for the graph, you wrote down your x value, which is negative 2 to the positive 2, right? And then you chose um, to plug in minus 3 and positive 3. Minus 3, positive 3, and 0. And you have to plug in between all, all the numbers that appear in between them. Okay, and you plug the, the numbers that you choose to plug in uh, into the second derivative? Into the second derivative, because these are what I'm looking for. So okay. if I'm looking for a concavior inflections, I must use the second derivative. Okay. Yeah. And now I can draw the graph. It's kind of a crooked y axis, but whatever. Um, what do we know so far? Intercepts, what do we have? The origin was one. Was that the only one? Okay. Um, vertical asymptotes, we did have those. Minus two. Two. Horizontal asymptote, did we have one? One. There was one again. And this guy, zero, zero, was a maximum. And let's write in our intervals, right, these guys. I'm increasing here back and between here and here. I'm decreasing here and there back. Now, the second derivative, you're, you're concave up from negative infinity to, the, to negative 2. That's concave up this whole time. This whole time I am concave down. And then the rest are concave up. This is concave up. And, the first, and in the middle, you could literally just fill in. It's just like a giant frowning face of the. Yep, right, the orange face. In fact, it's going to pretty much look like the same one. If you're never sure whether you cross this or not, you can plug in the um, plug in set the original function equal to one. You'll get zero equals minus four, which doesn't make any sense. So I know I never touch this. So to be increasing and concave up, I have to be above it the whole time. That was very similar to the previous example we did, but now you can see going through it faster with if the derivatives are given to you and everything. Any 
questions? Okay, let's go on to the next example. Example B. Can you do example B slower? Please. Slower. To do example B slower. <laughs> okay. Four <laughs> x over the x squared plus one. The prime is four times one minus x squared. The x squared plus one squared. The double prime is. Second and first derivatives. Yeah, I'm going to give it to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're writing the final, right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> At least by then you know what kind of questions are, right? <laughs> like you wouldn't know. Like by the time you get to the final, I've written four tests. Um, <laughs> they still get confusing. Yeah. Throughout. Sometimes it's like, oh my god, why? <laughs> There's a pattern. No, it's not. No, a pattern. You switch it up. Like, like you want like concepts, and then you want to solve the problems. Like, what are we gonna get? Is it concepts? Is it? Problems? No, no. I tell you a story about llamas just to distract you. So you just know, whenever you tell me a story about any kind of animal, or hot dogs, or whatever, just ignore that part. No, radioactive <laughs> hot dogs. <laughs> radioactive hot dogs, or whatever. It's just a distraction. In life, there are many distractions. You have to know how to identify them and ignore them. Okay, so um, domain we didn't care about. Find intercepts. X intercept. It's a fraction to find the x-intercept. The numerator equals zero, right? So, or x equals zero. So remember here for x-intercept, the numerator equals zero. Mm -hmm. So this means x is zero. So that's my x-intercept, y-intercept. So the bottom. The bottom. Nope. Right, you set oh. x equals zero. So I get y equals zero. Right, but of course if x equals zero, y has to be zero at the same time. That's where the axes cross. Wait, what? Once your x is zero, your y would have to be zero. So when you have a fraction and you're looking for the y intercept, you set the entire fraction to zero. Yes, but okay. setting a fraction to zero is the same as setting the numerator to zero. Okay. That's the only way a fraction could be zero is if the top is zero. Right. Um, yeah, so those are intercepts. Let's talk about asymptotes. Let's start with horizontal. If I take the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x over x squared plus 1, or I take the limit as x goes to minus infinity of 4x over x squared plus 1. What's this? Mm. Um, zero. Zero. And this is also zero. Okay. Wait. Oh, because that's a, that's a one exponent secret. There's a one. Power on the top, top is one, power on the bottom is two. The bottom the is bigger, you will off. always go to zero. Right? We did that when we were talking about limits. Um, right? So you, when you're taking limits to infinity, you're looking at the biggest powers, right? The biggest powers on the bottom, it's zero. The biggest powers on the top, it's plus or minus infinity. 
If the powers are the same, you take the ratio of the coefficients. But I'm confused because what does the power have to like tell me about when x is approaching infinity? So it's getting bigger. What, yeah, what gets bigger faster? Yeah, that's the idea. If you're squaring something, if you're looking at if you're looking at y equals x squared versus y equals x, eventually this guy gets so much bigger than this guy. Okay. It's like he's nothing. It's like the top is might as well be zero. Okay. Right? And then if the top is zero, then it's fine. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So the thing is, polynomials, they, once you increase the power, they will overwhelm the other guy. So x squared would always get huge in relation to x. Once it's bottom heavy, you will go to zero. If it's top heavy, you go to infinity. If they're the same, they increase proportionately. So. Top heavy goes to infinity, bottom heavy goes to zero, and if it's equal, you take the ratio of the coefficient. Ratio. It's proportional. Okay. So you'll take the coefficient here, divide by the coefficient here. Okay. Those are in your notes from way earlier. We did that a long time ago. Um, vertical asymptotes. So for vertical asymptotes, remember that you set the denominator equals zero. So you get x squared plus one equals zero. And what's the solution? or minus one? No solution. No real solution. Unless you want i's. Right. right, and we can't plot the i's, so we might as well be doing this. We might as well be imagining it. Right, so the denominator is never zero here. Right? So there's no vertical asymptotes. Okay, what's the next thing? Increasing um, second derivative. Uh, increasing, decreasing. Max and min. What do we use for that? Second derivative. No. For increasing and decreasing. I mean the first. It's the first derivative. Sorry. So we're going to use f prime is equal to four times one minus x squared over x squared plus one squared. Now remember, we first find the critical points. Those are the that's going to cre create the interval that we want to test. So is f prime equals zero or undefined? Notice that this denominator is never zero, so it's actually never undefined, right? Because x squared plus one is never going to be zero. Um, but what about f prime equals zero? It means the top is zero. This is going to mean that one minus x squared is equal to zero. Does that have solutions? No. Yes. It's a difference of squares. Like I can move this over and take the radical of both sides. Or I can write this as 1 minus x times 1 plus x. Those would be your answers. Can you? Yes. The difference of squares can be again. Like 1 minus x squared is the same as 1 minus x times 1 plus x. Right. Because right, think of this 1 as being the square. Mm -hmm. um, you could have also had 1 minus x squared equals 0. You move the x squared to the other side, then you take the radical of both sides, yeah. and get plus or minus. So, one way or the other. I recommend looking at it in the factoring way, because it, it's more universal. So, we're going to test this in the first derivative. And we only have to test minus 1 and 1, put in some random numbers over here, like a 2, a 0 in between, and a 2. So we're going to plug into the first derivative. Now again, notice the denominator is a square. So the denominator is always going to give me a plus sign. So I'm not going to care about its sign, I'm going to care about the top. Right? Now the top is going to be minus x times 1 plus x. And I know that the denominator is always going to be positive. So now let's start plugging things into the numerator. The 4 I can also ignore because that's a positive number. What happens here? Plug in a minus 2 here, I get a positive number. right? Plug in a minus 2 here, I get a negative. 
positive times negative is negative. So we're decreasing. Right? And you can literally plug in the minus two and find the answer, but I, it will take you more time to do that. Um, plug in a zero. One minus zero is one, which is positive. One plus zero is one, which is positive. So positive times positive, so that's increasing. Then I plug in a two. This will be negative, that will be positive, so that's negative. So what can I conclude here about minus one and one? Minus one's a min. Right, this guy has to be a minimum. One is a max. This guy has to be a maximum, right? Because it looks like this, and this looks like that. Okay, so now let's talk about increasing. So let's find the coordinates here. Um, so x equals minus 1 means that our y value is, what was our original function? That guy. Right? So it's going to be 4 times minus 1 over minus 1 squared plus 1. Right? Which gives us what? Minus 2. If x equals 1, this means our y value would be 4 times 1 over 1 squared plus 1, which is plus 2. So here, I have increasing, minus 1 to 1. I have decreasing, minus infinity to minus 1, union 1 to infinity. I have a maximum at 1, comma 2. I have a minimum at minus 1, comma minus 2. On that. Did you double check your max and min, or did you just, once you had it plotted on the line, you were not there? Double check it how? By taking it an actual, a real number just to the right and the left, and plotting it, and seeing... No, before that, I didn't know there were maximums and minimums. That's why I did that. So I plug in numbers to the right and to the left to figure out if it's positive or what the signs are. So once you have the, the minus followed by the plus, you're like, that's a local minimum. Yeah, and once my function actually existed. If my minus one was like an asymptote or it wasn't right, in the right, domain, right. all bets are off. But one is in this function. It's possible to plug in a one. Yep. But so as long as I'm decreasing, I pass through a point, and then I start increasing, I hit a minimum. Right? So I plug into the original function to get the actual coordinate. Right? That's what the original function tells us. I want to figure out is we're on concave up, concave down, or in fact, we're on having inflection points, and we use the second derivative. So first I'm going to find the critical points. Second derivative is zero or undefined. It's never undefined, the denominator is never going to be zero. That we figured out from earlier. So worry about where it's zero. Since it's a fraction, it's zero when the top is zero. I'm going to set 8x times x squared minus 3 equal to 0. How do I solve that? Well, you can either, you can try plugging, you can, well, in this case, x can literally be either 0 or whatever uh, x squared inside that parentheses will be to get zero. All right, so we have a product of two things, given as zero means one or the other is zero. So if either x equals zero or x squared minus three equals zero. So x equals zero is one of them. What is the solution here? Mm -hmm. X equals plus or minus radical three. Now those are the guys I, do I have space here? Line. I'm going to plug into the second derivative. 
points. So the testing is zero, minus radical three, and positive radical three. I'm plugging a random number over here. What do you have? Minus two. Here. Negative one, one, two. And I'm plugging into the second derivative. Notice again, the denominator is always going to be positive because it's an x squared plus one. So I'm only I care about the numerator. What? So my denominator is an x squared plus one. It's always positive. So let's look at the numerator for the signs. If I plug in a minus here, I get a negative number, minus two. Here, if I plug in a two minus two, what do I get? I get four minus three, which is positive. So overall, it's negative. If I plug in a minus one, this is negative. Here, this will again be negative, right? So negative times negative is positive. If I plug in a one, I get a positive times a negative. That's a negative. If I plug in a two, I get a positive number for the eight x, and I get a positive number here. That's positive. So negative, concave down like a frown. Positive is up like a cup. Down like a frown, up like a cup. But what can I say now? Any conclusions about minus radical 3? It's an inflection. Because it exists and my concavity changed. 0 will also be an inflection. This guy will also be an inflection. So there are three inflection points here. Um, let's find them. So if my x is minus radical 3, that means my y is going to be what? Minus 4 times radical 3 over radical 3 squared plus 1, right? Wait, what are you putting that into? The original the function. function. I'm finding coordinate, you always go to the original function, okay. which I think was 4x over, yes, yeah, 4x over x squared plus 1. So I would have that. So this would give me, in the denominator, radical 3 squared is 3, plus 1 gives me 4, cancels into that, so this is minus radical 3. If my x is plus radical 3, then my y would be positive radical 3. And if my x is 0, my y would be 0. So those are all my coordinates. So now I get my conclusions from the second derivative. I can tell you where I'm going to give up, where I'm going to give down, and what my inflection points are. So I'm going to give up. Minus radical 3 to 0. And radical 3 to infinity. I am going to give down. Minus infinity to minus radical 3. And 0 to radical 3. I have inflection points at 0, 0. Minus radical 3, comma, minus radical 3. And positive radical 3, comma, positive radical 3. So this one is not like the other one. One of these things is not like the others. Um, we had no vertical asymptotes here, so it should be interesting to see what this looks like. There were no vertical asymptotes, but we did have a horizontal one, right? It was actually y equals 0, right on the x-axis. The x-axis itself is a horizontal asymptote. It's dually. Um, did we have intercepts? Yes, there was That was the only one? Yeah. Okay, what else did we have? We had maximums and minimums, right? Where was a min maximum or minimum? We had a max at 1, comma 2. And a negative 1, comma negative 2. At 1, comma 2, was a max. 
And this here is a maximum. What it is. I had a minimum at minus one, comma negative two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a minimum. What else? I, these guys were inflection points. I have a question about the inflection. Yes. Shouldn't it be positive radical three, comma negative radical three? Uh, no. Because no. this was a positive four. Remember, this is four times a minus radical three. So if I plug in a positive, that's positive. And positive. Um, yeah, so zero comma zero is an inflection. I hit another inflection where? Minus radical three comma minus radical three. So let's say minus radical three is like here. I'll get an inflection point. Like here, that's an inflection. Um, and positive radical three, positive radical three. So there's some over here, and over here. And another inflection. Okay, so those are all my coordinates filled in. Where about, what about increasing and decreasing and all that stuff? Where were we increasing? Negative one to one. Negative one to one? Oh, I see how it goes. That's increasing, decreasing where? Everywhere else? Yeah. 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 So I'm decreasing over here, I'm decreasing over here, concavity, I'm concave up here. Yeah. And here. And then concave down everywhere else. Okay, put it all together. What does it look like? It literally is just like from the from the left it over here, where where am I? Yeah, you're asymptoting on the uh, x-axis, which you're Yeah, because that's my horizontal asymptote. And Am I coming from above or below? Below. How do you know? Well, plug in, uh, plug in zero to your, back into your original function. Um, you, you could do that, but we already did that, I think. Your concavity is negative, it's down, and then you can't pass the horizontal. Oh, you can. No, What's so funny? <laughs> There is the best medicine. No, how, how do you know? That's that's a serious question. Um, coming from negative infinity. Why why wouldn't I be above? Be I could be de I should be decreasing. What would happen if I decrease from above? You cross the as I cross the x axis, cross which would create an intercept. Which I know there is no intercept. It cannot be above, right? Boy, we so I know I have to be below. Yeah, it's over there. It's not right here. Right? So I know I should be leveling <coughs> off at this guy, but I should be decreasing and concave down until I hit that point here. Right? So that's the first part of my graph. Then I continue to decrease, but I switch the concave up. So I start turning around now. So I look like this. Now, when I'm in this region, I'm increasing concave up, so I still shape like a smiley face, and I, I increase it. But this point is an inflection point. I hit the concave down region, but I'm still in the increasing region, so I'm increasing concave down. So I'm going up, but I'm shaped like a frown. Now I hit the decreasing region, but for a while I'm still concave down, so I'm still shaped like a frown while decreasing. Then I hit this region where I'm concave up, but still decreasing. And that's my curve. This is my horizontal asymptote, so I'm going to level off here. So it was this weird shape like that. 
Right. Also, yeah. Okay. Sorry, is it fair to say that the fu the function that we drew is an odd function, right? Yes. Because uh, I'm like, would you get to tell that from the very beginning? Yeah. Right. Because your f of minus x is just it's, it's the minus of f of x if you plug it. If you check the numbers. So yeah, it's an odd function. It is symmetric about the y-axis. So like the, the little things like those are ways you can check that. Like, like, like now that we know it's not a function, it should look symmetric. Like it, it, those things should be good. Like, like, is that a good way to check it? Like, um, not, not really. I would Wait, and an odd function is only that? What? It's always no, like, <laughs> it's symmetric about the y. Yeah, yeah. so and like, then like, when we like finish the graph, it should look like that. <laughs> but, like, it should yeah, look I, I wouldn't really care at this point. Now. <laughs> I mean, if you if you if you graph it like that, <laughs> I wouldn't really. No, that's not. As long as you label these coordinates, yeah. the proper coordinates, <laughs> and and your 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 shape. At this point, I really care more about you telling me the points I specifically asked for and if the shape is correct. If you shape like a frowny face when you should, you shape like a smiley face when you should. Right? I'm not going to punish for bad artistic skills or crooked y-axis or anything. Like that. We should do that. Really high. So yeah, I'm not going to be like, oh, it's not symmetric. Well, as long as your scale is labeled correctly, it doesn't. Yeah, as long as these are kind of labeled correctly, it should it should be fine. Yeah. It's enough curve sketching for one day. Um, go practice. <coughs> Sketching stuff. Yep. Is it due tomorrow, given uh, despite the fact that it's like so involved? Um, give me the chapter. The you have until Monday to give me all the outstanding homework. Although I'd probably say Thursday, so you can probably ask me questions. No, let's say Monday. Um, if you have questions, I'd rather you ask me from the past finals, not from the homework. So yeah, we're going to do optimization. So you want us to be yes. looking at the past finals from here till yes. weekend? Yeah. Okay. Um, do the homework. It will give you good practice to do the homework, but I really want you to practice doing a problem the way it will, it will be written. Are you missing out on the email? Kind of just including what we're going to be on that? <coughs> Yeah, this test, it's, um, there's actually a lot of practice problems, as you can see from the review, but it's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, and it's pretty much going to be one problem from each uh, section. So, yeah, curve sketching is going to be one problem all on its own. Uh, so for test three, I'm going to tell you now what it looks like. There is going to be a problem on exponential growth and or decay. <laughs> Um, there will be, and I'm going to give you a problem on related rates. So I tell you the relationship between two things, tell you how fast one is moving, and I'm going to ask you how fast the other one is moving. Can you give us like a word problem where it's not confusing? <laughs> I think word problems are designed to be. No, 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 but you know, like the ladder, the foot of the ladder, whatever, that's easier than the, the plane. Spider swinging over. <laughs> Superman. <laughs> <laughs> Spider Man's <laughs> nerves up. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, curve sketching. So I'm going to give you a function, give you the derivative, and you draw the graph. 
after going through all those steps. And optimization is going to be the last one. Um, so, by far, optimization, this is the one that is most useful. Um, that's yeah. why calculus is super important. If you want to talk about using calculus in the real world, optimization is where it's at. Few people might use these, sure you're in the medical field or you're some sort of scientist studying radioactive things, whatever. Or you finance. Might do this. Or in finance, right? A little bit in finance when you're doing compound interest and all that, that sort of stuff. Um, related rates. Definitely. Um, you would use that, but again, it's it's more esoteric. Like everyone would use like optimization at some point. Um, so yeah, so that's what the, the third test is going to look like. There are going to be five problems. Pretty much these are going to be the problems. So, yeah, but optimization talks about optimizing something, which means to make it better, faster, stronger. Right? You want to be like make things really efficient. It turns out that in a lot of cases, doing that turns out to be nothing more than making something as large as possible or as small as possible. Right? So when you want to optimize a situation, you want to make something as big as possible or as, or as small as possible. So for example, <coughs> in the case of finance, if you're on top about profits, I want to maximize my profits. I want to make it as big as it can possibly be. If I'm talking about cost, I want to minimize cost, make that as small as it can be. Right? Um, but there's more to optimization because in the real life, we don't have unlimited resources, right? There's always some sort of restriction, right? There's scarcity, there's a restraint, right? So I can't just build an infinite number of buildings. I have a finite amount of concrete to get those buildings up, right? And I want to maximize my profits and minimize my costs while using only this fixed amount of concrete, right? So optimization is kind of making something as large as possible or as small as possible in the midst of some larger restriction. Right? So there's going to be some way you're restricted, but you still want to make things as good as they can possibly be within that restriction. And that is what optimization is about. Yes? Yeah, so like when I, when I worked in retail, the one question I always got was, I want the best insert product here for the cheapest. Yeah. That, that's like the most open-ended <laughs> question there is. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully it's an optimization it's, problem. Yeah, except you got way too many variables for way too many things. It's just I don't even know where to begin. Yeah, yeah. but that's yeah, that's kind of what we want to do here. We want to have our cake and eat it too. Right? Yeah. The best thing for the cheapest price is what we're after with optimization. Well, I can give you the best thing, but it's expensive. Or I can give you the cheapest thing, but it's you're not as good as you. Give them somewhere in the middle, and you just want to fulfill their needs as oh, best as you possibly I can't can. Afford so. It. <laughs> no, that's what they'll always come back. Because they never give a budget. They're just like, yeah, here's this sweater for 80 bucks. Oh, I can't afford it. But it's awesome. You said you wanted the best for the cheapest. Yeah, I'm serious. I get stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> but I want the best up to this price. Right? Yeah. That, that's what. That, like an optimization problem, that's an optimization. Give me the best you have for $65. That's what That better. gives you a limit. Right? That's at least helpful, but it's yeah. just like... And in optimization, you will be given that information. Like, I'm going to tell you what the restrictions are, and I'm going to tell you what I want. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say, this is what I want, this is my restriction, and you have to find the best possible case. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's very much similar to related rates in that there's a sequence of steps that you always go through, and you always go through it in this order. Right? So the order is important for the steps here. Um, so yeah, so... Yeah, that paragraph here was just a blurb about what I was saying, why it's important, and all that stuff. Um, so the steps are, again, read the problem carefully, understand the problem, read the problem. Um, two, draw and label a diagram is going to be useful here as well, right? So you can use, you're going to have to set up equations and the geometry of the situation can help you with that. And, um, Yeah, you're going to set up two sets of equations here, though. So that's how this differs from related rates. I just remembered something about the camera. It's probably going to run out of time. So. Um, I have to keep watching that red light. Uh, yeah, so you're going to set up two equations here. Now, the equations are called, as you see here, there's a constraint equation and an objective equation. The constraint is going to be that equation that describes the restriction that you have, right? So I'm going to tell you, this is how I'm restricted. You're going to come up with an equation to describe that. And then I'm going to tell you, this is what I want. You're going to come up with an equation to describe that. So there are going to be two equations. 
The constraint equation describes the restriction that you have. The objective equation is going to be the thing that you want to make as large as possible or as small as possible. Right? And it's going to be based on the situation. I can't give you anything more specific here. That's, that's just conceptually what you have to do. Now, what you're going to do in step four is pretty important. Because it, it turns out your objective equation will usually have several variables in it. It'll have x's and y's and stuff. Right. But we and can't do calculus with that. We're not in Cal 3 yet. So what we're going to do is in our constraint equation, you'll be able to solve for one of the variables to plug into the objective. So that's what you're going to do in step four. You're going to take the constraint equation. You always use a constraint, solve for someone, and plug into the objective. Right? Then that objective is going to give you a new function that you're going to find the maximum and minimum values of. Right? Um, in theory, you want the absolute maximum or minimum as big as possible or as small as possible. But rarely do those actually satisfy the requirements that you want. And it'll usually be local max and mins that gives you what you want, but you should always check anyway. Six is to answer the problem, right? So they're going to ask you for something specific. They might ask for an area, or a length, or a dimension, or a cost. Make sure you, your final answer gives them whatever they ask for, right? And we're going to go through all these steps. I'm going to illustrate the steps with the first problem, kind of um, um, relatively an easy problem to walk through, and we're going to illustrate these right? So with optimization. So here we're going to do example one from the handout. It is on. It is already on the website, so if you lose the handout, you just print it, print it from the website. Okay, so here's the problem. A farmer has 100 feet of fencing, and he wishes to make a rectangular enclosure. If he wants the enclosure to encompass the maximum possible area so that he can plant the maximum number of crops, what should the dimensions of the enclosure be? Right? That's a problem, right? He wants to build an enclosure for his crops so that you know the cows don't eat the crops or whatever. The llamas. Right? Or the llamas, right? He wants to keep the crops safe from the llamas, right? He only has a finite amount of fencing though. He can't use as much fencing as he wants. But with that amount of fencing, he wants to make that enclosure as large as possible so he can plant the most crops and sell the most crops to make the most money, right? So he wants to have his cake and eat it too. There's the restriction. This is what I want. The biggest garden I can possibly have. But my restriction is I only have 100 feet of fencing to make it work, right? Your goal is to figure out how can you make it work. What should the length and the width of this enclosure be? So step one. Read the problem so you understand what it is you want, what the restrictions are, right? So we're going to read, find out what we want, and what are the restrictions, right? So what we want is going to be to find a max or a min, right? In this case, what is it we want? A max. I want to make the area as big as possible. So I know I'm looking after a maximum point, and I know my restriction is the fencing that I have. So I read the problem, I understand that. That's what I'm after. To maximize area, I want to um, minimize, and I want to have the restriction of the fence. So two is to draw a diagram, right? So we're going to draw a picture. It says a rectangular enclosure, so I'm just going to draw a rectangle. I'm going to label this. OK, so far so good. Three. Now I'm going to find the constraint equations. and objective equations. So I have a constraint equation and I have an objective equation. Right? So now remember, the constraint is about your restriction. And what is our restriction here? You have 100 feet of fencing. 100 feet of fencing. How can I describe that in an equation based on this diagram? 2x uh, two, uh, two plus 2y equals 100. Right. The perimeter, the length around this box, should be 100. Right. So 2x plus 2y must be 100. Right? That is my constraint equation. This is an equation that describes the restriction that I have. Namely, the amount of fencing must be 100. Or x plus y equals 50. Right, you can simplify that to say x plus y equals 50. Right? Would simplifying make our life easier or would it not really make a difference? No, you're going to have to solve for one anyway. It will work out anyway. Um, but yeah, you can look at it that way. Objective is what we want to maximize or minimize, right? What we want to maximize or minimize. In this case, I know we want to maximize. What do I want to maximize? Area. Area. 
Based on this diagram, can you tell me an equation that describes area? X. X, Y equals area. Right. Area, which I'm going to call A, is equal to X times Y. Like times width. Mm -hmm. So now I have these two equations. The one I want to find the maximum point on is this equation. But I have two variables. That is a problem. But I have another equation that has those same two variables. Right? That leads us to step four. This is the guy I want to find the maximum point of. There are two variables, though. That doesn't help me. So, in, no, no, no. no, since x plus y equals 50, this means that I can solve for my y to get 50 minus x. This means that my area function, I can write it as x times 50 minus x. Right? So I'm going to solve for one variable here and plug it in here. That's always what you do. You always solve for something in your constraint and plug it into the objective. System of equations. <coughs> um, it's kind of like a system of equations, but you have more unknowns than you have variables, yeah. right? Notice that you have three unknowns, but only two equations. But the calculus is going to help us get around that. Right? So I'm going to solve for some of my constraint, plug it into the objective. So I get this new equation for my objective. The equation now only has one variable, x. Right? That's step four. Now, step five is where the calculus is applied. I want to make that as large as possible, so what am I going to look for? You're going to take the derivative of that thing and then set it equal to zero and find the maximums. Right. Wait, wait. Why do you want to take the derivative? That's how we find maximums. Okay. Right? If I have a function, I want to find where's the maximum and minimum points, right? Yes. Remember, increasing, decreasing the maximums and minimums comes from first, first derivative. derivative. So that's what we're going to do. So here's this function which is 50x minus x squared, I would not use the product rule, that's a waste of time. I'm just <laughs> multiply it out, it's a power rule problem. I want to find the maximum of that problem. Sure, it's a quadratic. Sure, I could use the, the, um, the formula for the vertex, right? But let's <coughs> not this, because you might not always have a quadratic, you could have something else. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is five, is that we're going to find the derivative. This is going to be 50 minus 2x. Now I'm going to find critical points. This means my a prime equals zero or undefined. It's never actually undefined. It's a polynomial. So this means it's where it's equal to zero. And x is 25. And so x would be 25. You will notice that if you did the vertex formula, that's the answer you would have gotten. So my x must be 25. Now, um, Usually you don't have to do this. Um, I'll just do it anyway to convince you guys. Don't do this <laughs> unless there are several values and the answer is ambiguous. So technically speaking, right, the maximum va value I can have for an x value is 100, and the minimum value I can have for an x value is 0. right? So that's my closed interval, technically. Uh, but obviously, neither of these options are plausible. right? Because if my x is 0, there is no rectangular right enclosure. If my x is 100, there is no y. There is no rectangular right enclosure. So the, the point I'm after is somewhere in the middle. right? Now I claim it's going to be around 25. right? So what I'm going to do is I can plug in a number on this interval, like a 1. Right? Now I'm going to plug in a 1, right, plug in the easiest one, into the derivative. You'll notice you get a positive number, which means increasing. Plug in a number over here, like a 26. Plug into here, you'll notice I get a negative number, which is decreasing. So this guy is actually a maximum. Now my point is, you usually don't have to check it. There's only one possible answer. That has to be the guy we're looking for. right? There are cases where if this was a cubic, you'd have two answers here, and then you'd have to do this check. Only if you have to. Obviously, if one answer is negative and the other is positive, you just it can't be negative, it has to be the positive, right? Because you can't have a negative amount of fence, right? So usually you don't have to do the check, but I'm showing you how you would do it if you would want to do it. But usually it's gonna be obvious that guy's the answer, right? There's only one x value, that has to be the answer. 
Isn't there a way to do um, that test with the second derivative? Yeah, I could take the second derivative and plug in 25 as well. That's called the second derivative test. Yeah. So anyway, I took the derivative, found the critical points. I only got one. That has to be my answer. X has to be 25. And so now we are finally on step six. So what were we asked for at the beginning of this problem? Dimensions. Yeah, we were specifically asked for dimensions. So it's not okay for me to say x equals 25. <laughs> I have to tell you, length is this, width is that. All right? That's the answer. Both right? your lengths and widths should be 25. So now x equals 25, it's going to be, that was my width. Now I'm going to have to find the other one, which is my y. Now my y I know was 50 minus x. 50 minus 25. So that's 50 minus 25, which is also 25. This means dimensions are length is 25 feet, width is 50 feet, 25 feet. You get the unit is it's a I don't think I get here. But that's what you have to tell me. You can't tell me x equals 25. You haven't answered the problem. I asked you for dimensions. So you have to make sure you say the dimensions. Right? At the end of the day, this must be your conclusions. This is the length you need, this is the width you need, right? So if a farm actually came to you, I only have 100 feet of fencing, I need to make a rectangular enclosure that covers the most area, that's what you're going to tell them. Make the length 25 and the width 25, right? That will give you the most bang for your buck. That is the rectangle you would have where the perimeter is 100 and the area it encloses is as big as possible. And you're sure the farmer is not going to get smart, like, oh, I asked for a rectangle, you gave me a square. Well, a square is a rectangle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, show me the dictionary. A square is a rectangle where all the, the length and the width are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it turns out a square enclosure was the best possible case here, 25 by 25. If you come up with any other set of numbers where the perimeter is 100, it will give you a smaller area than that. Right? So I could have come up with something like um, 10, 10, um, 40, and 40, right? That, Perimeter is also 100. The area is actually smaller, right? Any other combination of numbers I came up with, it will give me a smaller area. This is the one that has the biggest area, right? And calculus allows us to know that, right? So we had this situation where we wanted to make something as big as possible, but we had a restriction, optimization to the rescue, right? That's what it's used for, right? Whenever you want to maximize or minimize something under some sort of restriction, optimization is what you go to. And this is pretty much where it's at with calculus. So a lot of these models are just optimization models. How you get the most out of something with the minimum amount of resources spent. Um, we will stop there and we'll pick up with do some more examples tomorrow. So looks like we get it to the end. Um, start working on the review so that.